Hello everyone, there's a few things I want to cover in this video which answer some common questions like do I need a guru? Should I join a group? How do you really kill the ego? And is killing the right word we should use for that? And how do I kill it during alchemy? So this is really going into what a lot of people call shadow work, right? And in essence, my answers just come from a place of really wanting to give you the spirit or the enthusiasm or fire of what it really means or what it really feels like to be on this path of devotion to really awakening the consciousness within us, uh, which is not anything to do with the external, but totally internal. Now, to start with, for those people who have the inclination to maybe follow me or other spiritual teachers, or just really like me or put me on a pedestal or something, because I've seen comments um, of people, you know, calling me a great teacher, you are a great master gene, or you're a light worker sent here to save humanity or something like that. So I want you to know that whatever I'm sharing, I'm also learning. That's how the third factor of Gnosis works. Uh, definitely check that video out if you've not already. Which means that by what you give out to others, you also receive illumination on in return. So, and I can tell you that from experience, that's how it works. As soon as the intent is there to give higher information from a pure heart for the benefit of others, of humanity, you already quickly start understanding what you're going to teach. So what I'm saying is, even though I'm sharing and teaching, I'm also just a student like all of you. We're all the same. And who knows, maybe I will become an actual master one day, but um, I doubt that I would even reveal or call myself that because I know how complicated it can be to do that. And my, my main point is never blindly follow any master. You know, what is the use of following someone else if you're not following the way to incarnate your own master within yourself? That's the only master that ever really matters, you know? What's the point in being a caterpillar watching butterflies fly around you? It's more important to go into your own metamorphosis and transform into a butterfly yourself to devote the many years that is required to do that. Which means to die within yourself, to yourself every day, and gestate in the process of spiritual birth and death, and to really change. So this is what this video will be about. So books, videos, masters, they're all just there to guide you to do just that. So the answer is yes, you do need a guru, but the guru is within you. The master is your innermost being. It's not a thinking or a doing, it's a being, right? It's an intelligence from your being, right? So it is the silent voice of your intuition, which comes from your heart that guides you through quick and direct hunches and feelings in your conscience. It tells you every single correct way to be, correct way to think, correct things to study, to meditate, everything. And so what will our being tell us uh, to do in order to awaken? Well, let's go into this more, uh, more deeply and give some examples. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is symbolic to show that Arjuna was on the path to awakening and he found himself on the battlefield of consciousness. Uh, he was in a war, right? You can read up like a summary of ba the Bhagavad Gita if you've not already. I'll put links in the description below, like with all of my videos. So Arjuna was on this battlefield, right? And he said to himself, I don't want to fight. I don't want to kill. 
Um, but luckily, Arjuna listened to his inner master, who was Krishna, by his side. Krishna is his inner being, his Christ consciousness in his heart, telling him, no, you must fight, you must obey me, obey his being, and do as I say, kill your enemies, which means to kill enemies within, right? Obviously, it doesn't mean to kill actual people, right? It is a spiritual text, an esoteric text that is pointing towards the inner journey of the soul to awaken. And part of that awakening is to kill the ego within yourself. Those are the enemies and egos, right? Plural, meaning many different egos. We don't just have one. So the Quran says exactly the same thing, uh, so does the Bible, so does the Torah. They all tell us to become fighters, so not just to, you know, meditate a certain amount of the day, but to really get rid of ego entities that run around in the mind and cause us to suffer and doubt and be fearful and confused. It's that darkness that uh, stops us from hearing the voice of our inner being. You know, in uh, the Gnostic teachings, it's generally understood that each person carries within their consciousness, on average, 10,000 egos. So, a lot, right? And um, probably even more in, in most cases, especially these days. And there's a great ancient teaching which synthesizes the head of each army of that legion of egos that we have within the psychological space within us. So a synthesis of uh, psychological entities. Um, it's, a, it's a way to understand them. And we all know this ancient teaching. Uh, but we just don't work with it. It goes back to the law of seven again, like the seven chakras. It's the seven sins. These are the seven vices that keep the consciousness imprisoned. And so when we talk about transmutation, we're really talking about transforming vices into virtues. So, for example, we turn laziness into diligence, lust into chastity envy into happiness for others, anger and hate into love, gluttony into temperance, greed into altruism, and pride into humility. The seven sins is actually a beautiful and ancient synthesis of human psychology that we totally overlook. So, this is my answer. If you want an intimate connection with a real master you can listen to, then first kill the noise of your ego and it will arise naturally. Of course, not by forcing yourself, but you do kill the noise, you can say, through love too, because love is the Divine Mother Kundalini who transforms our consciousness. I know a lot of people uh, react to the word kill, like, you know, kill your ego. Ooh, you know, that sounds scary or cruel, you know, poor ego. <laughs> like, um, like it's our little puppy friend that we love, you know. The thing is, um, ego is just illusory. It's self-created. If you want to live in a self-created delusional world, a dream world, with your ego friends, then do that. <laughs> but if you want to awaken to reality beyond your own delusions, then say bye-bye to your ego friends, right? It's as simple as that. It's not a complicated matter, actually. We're just so attached to ourselves, to our egos. So, for example, when a thought or dream, or reaction, or negative mood comes in throughout the day. Don't follow it. Be here now. You know, it's offering you a narrative. Say no. Come back to the present moment. Nine times out of ten, if you follow an ego thought, it will lead you to misery, moodiness, gluttony, disappointment, anger, fantasies. One of the seven vices, right? 
in the video called A Very Powerful Method for Astral Projection, I describe a way to be for three days, like a, a homemade uh, Visapana retreat. Now, in reality, what I talk about there is not just for astral projection. If those three days of practice is done properly, a person is without egos or ego in those moments. So really, that technique is meant to be applied to our whole life eventually. You know, that video basically just says, be present always, no matter what, right? No matter what challenges or temptations arise. So this whole path of awakening is not just about being a stereotypical peaceful monk. That's not really indicative of what the path looks like. We are peaceful outwardly, but inwardly there's this steadfast conviction of willpower uh, to be here now always and to stay in the being no matter what right? To claim heaven on earth with strength and tenacity. Um, you know, it says in the Bible somewhere that heaven is taken by force, you know? So uh, to expand on this practically, when an ego dream comes in and you snap back to the present moment here and now, you exited a daydream in those moments, right? You killed an ego. You defeated it. You slayed a monster because you said no, right? Because you said yes to the here and now. Of course, it might come back later, um, but at least for now, you stayed in consciousness and you are in reality. So this practice is from moment to moment to moment, to moment, etc., right? Always remembering yourself and being in the being, in the consciousness, because we really struggle to do that, you know? In meditation, a lot of people think we're trying to reach some sensationalist, amazing states with visions and things like that, right? When really, staying in consciousness is very simple. It's more about how you, how long you can stay in it. You know, if you look at the tip of your finger, you know, how long can you only concentrate on the tip of your finger without distractions and thoughts coming in? You know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds. In just less than 60 seconds, you can observe the chaos in your mind and the necessity to meditate. So, and it's also useful to use an extreme example of killing ego. Think of a man who killed a person, and when he's in court, uh, people ask him, why did you kill that person? A lot of the time, murderers will say something like, I don't know what came over me, right? In other words, I don't know what took over my mind and my body. I was possessed by an ego of anger and murder, maybe even jealousy or passion if it was his wife or something. And in those moments after killing the person, you know, he was probably like, he dropped the knife or something, you know, shaking and asking himself, what have I done, you know? So, you know, and in most cases, he probably doesn't know what he did. He probably blacked out. A lot of people do, right? Sometimes we say they saw red and then they don't remember anything. Well, yeah, you know, they were nothing short of possessed. So for those who say not to kill the ego, do you think this man, this, this murderer man, uh, should keep this ego entity existing within the psychological space of his consciousness? Obviously not. Um, you know, we're so, we're so lukewarm. You know, we're in the middle of things. Uh, we just say, you know, just go to a psychotherapist. You can manage it. You know, we say go to anger management and just manage yourself, right? Never, never do we say kill it. You know, get rid of it. You don't want that. 
You know, we never say you need to change because I think for the most part, we don't believe we can change, you know? We're so identified with our egos, with our sins, our vices, not recognizing it is not us, it is ego. We lack faith that we can actually detach and study and, and get rid of it, you know? Because if you don't, it will always, always stay in the background of your life, making a mess of things. And that's why many countries have death sentences for crimes like murder. As above, so below. That ego of murder can be seen in the astral plane. And in the physical plane, people can sense that and they want to kill it. We sense that there is some divine justice there to kill that ego. Obviously, I am not agreeing with the death sentence. I do not. Um, you know, that's the wrong way to solve the problem. But of course, we're spiritually blind, right? And we do not see that it wasn't the real person within the essence of that actual person who committed the crime. It was an ego he carries inside his psychological space, right? It was a psychological entity taking up space within his consciousness, within the interior of the person. So yes, that ego needs to be death sentenced, but not the actual uh, person the actual divinity of that soul. And for those people who say, yeah, but you need the ego because it helps you to get things done. Why get things done with your ego? You, you know, do you think that you need your ego to do your shopping, clean your house and get your work done? No, you don't, you know? You use your mind to get things done, very simple. Don't let the ego use the mind. So you, the essence, use the mind. You know, if you let the ego use it, uh, then, then you daydream, you become uh, autonomous and mechanical. You also become inauthentic in what you do. So start doing things without ego, and then suddenly the mundane things you do in the world will suddenly become deeply joyful and satisfying because you'll be present instead of possessed, thinking you need to do this and that, thinking about the next thing you need to do and whether you're doing it right, adding more narratives over reality, you know? Anyone in history who ever did anything great, did it without ego. Because if you have ego, it stains your work. It stains everything. And there's a lack of genuine joy and enthusiasm in what you're doing. Because instead of doing what you're doing, you're thinking about what you're doing. So there's a difference between mind and ego. The mind is a beautiful tool, uh, but when it's used by ego, it's destructive and creates selfishness. So enlightenment is about claiming your own mind back. No need to rely on some separate mode of being, you know, be in the moment. And so how do you kill the ego? How do you get rid of that noise so you can take life by the reins and hear start hearing the voice of guidance, the voice of God within you. Well, we've covered this a lot on the channel, right? And, you know, once you get it, it's very simple, but the challenge is high because there is a lot of ego, as we saw. So, of course, it all starts with the choice to change, right? Very little people make this choice, and it's not just because we're not honest enough to make that choice, or be honest about uh, our state of ego, but that we are blissfully ignorant, and not just ignorant, but ignorant that we're ignorant. So 
It's first about having the honesty and sincerity to recognize how unconscious we really are and then make the resolve to change. And then in your daily life, you aim to be present and be conscious in the moment, always. And in your struggle, every time you come back to the present, you kill the ego. It doesn't exist in that moment because you are here and now and aware of yourself. You know, imagine you're walking down the street and a daydream starts coming to you, but you decide to cut it out. You dissolve an ego in that moment, back to the present, awake, the dream is dissolved. Now, if you can't get present and there's a strong mood or fantasy or an ego is pulling you in and keeps coming back, you can then, and you can do this all the time with any ego, you can pray and petition, just internally, no one needs to hear it, you can pray to the Divine Mother Kundalini, who is the sexual force, the force of love, to transform or transmute the energy of that ego. And you, you'll you see, if you do it with infinite faith, concentration, persistence, and psychological comprehension and observation, then the ego uh, and the energy of that ego will go. It will dissolve. If it's taking a while to go, um, or it's a very strong ego, keep praying, keep praying, it will go. You can try it out for yourself. So this is also a type of energy work too. And in this way, uh, if you keep staying present in your life, you'll start changing rapidly. You'll start seeing your egos more. You'll start knowing yourself more. Um, and why do you see them? You know, you start seeing your egos by being attentive. And then you'll enter your own metamorphosis over time. This can be also done during alchemy. So this is why in the video on the three factors of gnosis, ego death comes first. The whole point of alchemy, transmutation, meditation, astral projection, everything, is always to awaken out of the ego. You know, if you watch the the White Tantra Uh, video a couple of weeks ago, it's great, right? You can gain a lot of energy. But what good is it if that energy goes to the ego? You'll fail because you won't be in the moment, in your body. So the point of White Tantra is to harness that energy, which is Kundalini, the Divine Mother, and to direct it at dissolving the ego, the bull, which results in transmutation of lower energy. And of course, for this, you need tremendous concentration, willpower, and presence in those moments of practice. This is why it's called alchemy and transmutation. It is a science that allows us to change one substance into another, to change lead into gold, to transform the gross substance of ego into light to steal back the light of consciousness from the ego, which has stolen it from us originally. So working with Kundalini, raising that fire is like getting in touch with your true mother within yourself, your mother who is in secret, the divine mother. And she will tell you what to do in your life in any moment. And if we resist doing that, and if we don't live our life in alignment with our divine purpose, then we aren't handling that energy properly, and the serpent will bite us, and we'll feel pain, and uh, we'll become unbalanced, and, you know, maybe fail in some kind of way. So, kundalini isn't just some energy to be enjoyed, but it's an intelligence that we follow, and that... uh, It's an intelligence that puts us on the straight and narrow path. And that's the 
practice of this path. Always being in the present moment, being attentive no matter what, always being aware internally of introspection, of knowing yourself, inwardly feeling the energies of the whole body, always watching the thoughts, the feelings, the actions and words you say. Nothing in the field of your consciousness ever should go unwatched. So we should always be, you know, watching the movements in your mind, your heart, your sexual center, your motor instinctive center, meaning how your body moves by itself. And if you are alert and watch, then things will not take over you because you are home within yourself. Intruders only come when the lights are off. So if you're always watching, you will see eventually, you will see the ego. Uh, a lot of people ask, I don't see my ego. You know, how do I uh, start to change if I don't know what to change? Well, you have to look, you know, you're not looking, you're dreaming. So if you're not at home, we leave the keys unlocked, right? You wouldn't leave your house unlocked, would you? Um, have you ever, you know, left your house wondering if you locked the door or not? You can't remember whether you did because you weren't awake in those moments. And you wouldn't let strangers in your house unwillingly, would you? Yet we do all the time. We never lock our internal doors and egos run rampant in our psychological homes. I've seen this for myself. It was one of the first uh, experiences that I had. I saw how crazy people, egos, my egos, were just partying, going wild, coming in and out of my house. Uh, I couldn't even get inside. It was that chaotic. I remember trying to get inside my house. I couldn't, you know, and I knew this was my, my psychological home in the astral. So... You can see this for yourself too. So that's the teaching. Kick your egos out and gain control over your own house and stay at home as COVID advertisements keep telling us, right? Um, this is why Jesus said, my house, my inner temple or body or consciousness, my house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves. The thieves being egos who, uh, who steal the treasures inside our home. The treasures being consciousness, uh, just like Alibaba and the 40 thieves. The story is exactly the same. And what do we do with these thieves? You know, you have to reduce them to cosmic dust, as Master Samael says. You know, why do you think Hindu, Greek, Norse gods and goddesses and archangels, why do they hold so many weapons? They need them, right? There's so many things to kill, always. Um, even the Christian saints, uh, they had the best weapon, right? Which is the crucifix, the, the powerful force of the love of Christ. So it is a war that you have to win, not an external war, but a war for your soul. The problem is in the physical plane that we apply this universal truth that we all feel within ourselves, we apply that to external reality. We falsely find purpose in that. For example, we declare war on drugs, war on gender, war on climate change, war amongst nations. That's all futile and meaningless unless you take up the inner war, the revolutionary war of the soul. That's the only thing that will make a difference in this physical world, the only thing. So to rewind as to why I'm saying all this, as long as we have ego, we will always see the external world through the lenses of it. So if you have a guru, a teacher, a master, or a group, or a church, or whatever, fine, good. You know, just don't expect that teacher or group to do any of your work for you. 
we only awaken according to the merits of our hearts, meaning we only start to perceive reality beyond ourselves when we make the choice and the effort to kill the ego, to transmute, to help others. Until then, everything you read or hear from others and, you know, is just speculative and theoretical. We can only gain direct knowledge, gnosis, through the heart. And the path is always within, here and now, in the heart, not outside of us, not in books or theories or beliefs. And I say all this as well because I had a lot of questions over the past year after people, you know, hearing that I was part of a Gnostic group and asking, you know, how can they join one? Well, you certainly can if you feel that that's the correct thing for you to do. You can see my video on what is Gnosis. There are many great links and resources and videos and books there in the description for you to study. But what's the main point of this video? I'm saying to you that you can go read those books, watch videos, uh, maybe even find a legitimate master, but you'll learn nothing and you won't change if you don't apply what you're reading and learning within yourself. And what's the main reason most don't apply it and don't change? Well, firstly, there are people who are just lazy and don't do it, right? Okay, we all know that. Um, we've, we've all been there too, of course. Um, secondly, there are those who read but react because they don't really know how to use their intuition while studying. Then thirdly, I'd say there are those who can intuitively read and understand everything very well intellectually, but it's like this. They, they learn to perceive and comprehend an amazing, sublime, intellectual thought, form, structure, mentally, and maybe even emotionally. And it goes, you know, this amazing structure is like cosmic and beautiful, but are they actually climbing up it? Are they actually integrating it? In most cases, they're just marveling at its beauty and talking about it, maybe poetically. And if you ask that person to climb up it or integrate it, um, they just, you know, make an excuse, say they'll do it tomorrow, say they're busy or something. So that's how it is for most of us. We're too lazy to study, too lazy to be honest when we read, and then lazy... Uh, too lazy to apply the knowledge from moment to moment. It's really this sin of laziness or sloth that stops everything, right? Um, I know sin is a strong word too. It can be translated to error. So just wrongdoing. It's just not the correct thing to do. That's what sin means. So groups and teachers are fine. Not necessary, but fine. And my advice is to just stay detached, not identified with it, and just use it to aid and support your own path internally. Don't start thinking you can't live without it. I would say that's wrong. Um, that's attachment to external circumstances. And also, um, I've not shared this experience, actually. Uh, it relates very well. In an astral projection experience I had, uh, I found myself on a road after coming out of body, and I saw a sign on the road pointing to directions to a Gnostic group. So, of course, I'm like, oh, interesting, you know, I should go check that out. So, after following the directions, going down this road, I see a beautiful school in a big courtyard with nice gardens uh, all around this nice building. So I go inside, it's all beautiful, perfectly set up, there's statues around, and I go inside uh, one of the lecture rooms, uh, one of the classrooms where I hear people talking. I see a group of about 12 people in there, and, you know, I say, hey, is this a Gnostic school? They say, hey, yes, welcome, come inside. And... To cut a longer story short, I eventually asked them, 
when is the next lecture or when is the next talk and what is it about? And they say, oh no, we don't really give talks anymore. And I'm a bit surprised. So I say, oh, but you do, uh, you at least do practices, right? And they say, no, not really. And it was in that moment after looking around at the people scattered in the room, uh, having different conversations, I realized that in most groups, whether Gnostic, spiritual, religious, most of them devolve or degenerate into merely social groups. It's just a place where people agree on ideas in their heads, uh, make friends and socialize. And now there's nothing wrong with that, but the, the original purpose behind the group has been lost. There's no more genuine spiritual longing, no more fire in the heart of people sharing this passion to really initiate into the real self-discovery of themselves and of the cosmos. So that's my other uh, piece of advice too, that remember not to be too comfortable, especially in a group that you feel has lost this fire. You know, in a more extreme uh, version of that, Maybe you're uh, part of a mosque or a church or a synagogue or whatever, you know, that's great. But maybe you think, you know, you're safe and comfortable then. Uh, we see and hear all the time, only believers of the Bible will be saved from the apocalypse or believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be okay. You know, it's like a, it's like a TV advert we keep hearing and it's, um, it's ridiculous. It's, it's mechanical and, and unintelligent. You know, I'm not saying don't believe in the Bible or Jesus, believe in it. It's great. But belief makes no difference. What we need to do is apply it from moment to moment. That makes the difference. So it's not comfort that awakens us, but uncomfort in the realization of our own unconsciousness, and that takes courage and uh, exploration, right? So the only thing that matters is your resolve to change internally, to say and pray and ask to your divine father within, my heart is open, show me the way to change, to really blossom in my consciousness, because nothing external will ever give you that. It's all just a play of endless searching until you just close your eyes and really listen. This is why the external world is called Maya in Buddhism, meaning illusion, or Leela in Hinduism, meaning a divine play. So don't get caught up in the play. Don't you think it would be ridiculous to go to uh, watch a movie and then get angry and take the story so seriously, right? But we do that all the time, not with movies in the theatres, but with the movie of our own personal life. Our life is just a movie and it's our responsibility to watch and learn, but not get identified and attached, and not create more narratives on top of the movie, you know, more egos that want to manipulate the movie because of its resistance towards it. You know, the ego is never satisfied with the movie and always gets in the way of what is meant to happen in your life, you know? Inshallah, God willing, right? Let that will be done, not the will of the ego, of the selfish one. And again, this is something we have to fight for, because even if we are happy with no group and no teacher, we ourselves are mechanical, and our practices can also become mechanical. Uh, maybe we say, whether in a group or not, okay, every day I at this time, I'm going to meditate to be present in the moment. And great, you do it one day, great. The next day, great. The third day, 
you know, just doing the same thing? Are you being mechanical, monotonous? Meditation should never be the same, you know? Is, is this how consciousness really awakens? Just doing the same old practices and meditations? So the way to awaken to the light is to steal back that light from that which has taken it. So what's more fundamental than meditation is temet noske, know thyself. If you aren't focused on knowing who you are fully, then your, your meditations will not be as fruitful as they should be. And you have to be watchful to actually see yourself. Then life becomes more present naturally because whatever arises is being shined with the light of your consciousness, which dissolves it, which dissolves the darkness, you know? Light your torch in a dark room, everything comes to the light and you can see it. So you see, we can't even see the movie of our life. We need consciousness to actually observe it and see it and turn on that torch. So it's easy and nice to meditate, right? To close your eyes and have a nice meditation. But what's the use in spending hours in meditation if you still have negative code inside the system of your being that brings blindness to your consciousness. So, yes, it's an infinite topic, right? And I'll leave some resources down below, as always, for you to study and learn from. And so, to conclude quickly, a group will never awaken you, a master will never awaken you, uh, an experience will never awaken you. This video won't awaken you. Only your efforts, your honesty with who you are and efforts with really changing yourself here and now, that will awaken you. And when I say efforts, I don't mean like, oh, what an effort, right? I mean, I mean the mechanism in our consciousness that executes the power of will, you know, to just do and go and work and see the ego, you know, don't think about it, just do and be and do it perfectly and impeccably like a Zen master, not trying to be perfect, but actually just being perfect. I don't mean in an egoic way, I just mean right action, right, to do what is most appropriate and right for whatever situation you're in. So yes, that's my advice. Don't rely on groups or teachers. No true teacher would want you to rely on them or blindly follow them. They only want to point you to access your own real teacher that is within here. So rely only on your own control, discipline, willpower, intuition, and then your connection with your own divinity will strengthen a lot faster, and you will see your path a lot more clearly, and a lot of, a lot of new information will start coming, a lot of more um, understanding, and a lot of signs, both in your waking life and in your uh, dreaming astral life, right? A lot of synchronicities, because when you see the darkness and you see all of this unconsciousness, then a natural questioning starts coming, right? Uh, a natural self-inquiry and you there's things you want to start to know and get enlightened about and simply through wanting to know those things all the information starts coming if you're patient you know and um you'll be guided to the right books to the right practices whatever so yes Okay, so I know I covered a lot of topics here um I can go into some of them more deeply but for now those are just some things I wanted to get out there for some of you to meditate on. Feel free to ask questions below as always and see you not next time because uh, here and now is the only time, right? So there is no then but only now. Okay, thank you.